All right. Good evening, everybody. Welcome to our final night of Matters of the Heart, Lessons from 1 Samuel. Uh, as we are watching this tonight and participating in this together, it is Wednesday night, May the 26th. And as I mentioned, this is the last night that we will be uh, offering this virtual class online uh, between uh, our summer series and other things we're going to be do doing this summer, we are not going to be offering a pre-recorded message or a pre-recorded class here uh, on Wednesday nights. Uh, so we are finishing up a look at some of the matters of the heart from uh, 1 Samuel. And tonight we are going to be looking at the matters of the heart, the heart of a friend. 1 Samuel chapter 1, uh, 18 and 20. And we're going to really just kind of uh, uh, paraphrase what happens in these chapters, and we're going to look at some things about friendship. And of course, if you know anything about 1 Samuel, you probably have heard of the friendship that Jonathan and David had. And we're going to examine that friendship just a little bit tonight and make some applications uh, to our lives and to our world. And, uh, of course, you'll remember that Jonathan is the son of King Saul. And he is a brave young man because if you remember in an earlier chapter, we looked at the lesson where Saul is in hiding and he's afraid of the Philistines. He's afraid of the opponents. And Saul takes his, I'm sorry, Jonathan takes his young armor bearer uh, out to the battle and has success. And we looked at that story several weeks ago. Tonight, we're going to look at his friendship that he develops with David. And we're going to do that in our final session of Matters of the Heart. But before we do, let's bow together and let's pray. God, open our minds and our hearts to your word tonight. Bless us as we study. Thank you for those that have faithfully been here each week to be a part of our discussion and those that will jump on later and watch and learn as well. And Father, we pray that you would just uh, guide my thoughts tonight as we wrap this series of lessons up. It's in the name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. All right, so to set the scene and to begin to think about what we're going to talk about tonight, I want you to think about friendships and social media. And I want you to think particularly about the question I have on the screen. Have we lost the idea of what a true friend is? You know, if you jump on Facebook, and many of you have Facebook, obviously, because many of you are watching it on Facebook tonight, but if you have Facebook or you know others that have Facebook, uh, we collect friends uh, who will see our post, they will keep up with our lives, they will keep up with what's going on in our lives, and some of us may have uh, thousands of friends. Um, I'm not sure what the friend limit on Facebook is or if there is a friend limit on Facebook. Uh, and I don't even know fully what, uh, how many friends I have on Facebook. I probably should have checked this and uh, maybe I'll do that real quick as we're going on here. Uh, it says on Facebook that I have 1,685 friends. 1,685 friends. Now, the reality of that is none of us can really literally have 1,685 friends, but that's what Facebook tells me I have. So in other words, I have 1,685 people who follow me on Facebook, uh, who interact with me in some way, whether it's just reading my post, seeing my post, or whatever on Facebook. Um, as I comb through, and if I were to do this tonight, as I comb through the, the uh, Facebook list of friends that I have, I will recognize a lot of names, but there are some names that I'm Facebook friends with that uh, I've never met personally. Uh, people have heard me speak, or maybe they've tuned into some of our live streaming things, and they just send me a request to, to follow my Facebook. Uh, so there's a lot of people on there that I'm really not friends with, because I really never have met them. Um, and it's impossible for us to have 1,685 friends, or whatever number you may have uh, on Facebook. But we might be tempted to reduce friendships to how many Facebook likes we get, who's sharing our post, who's commenting on our post. And we run the danger of really losing the idea of what a true friend is. You see, if I'm in need, for example, 
or if I am in a dire circumstance or a dire situation and uh, I need some assistance or I need some help, I'm probably not turning to all 1,685 friends that I have on Facebook. Uh, again, I just told you that I, there's some people that I'm friends with on Facebook that I've never personally met, so I would not reach out to them. But do I have a few people in my life who are really true friends and I ask for help, they'll help me in a heartbeat? And I, I'm sure I do. I, I'm sure many of you are in that friendship circle. But I wonder sometimes if we just kind of relegate friendships to social media likes, social media shares, social media follows. And maybe in our culture today, we're really struggling to know what a true friend is and what a true friend looks like. And that leads us to the story that we're going to look at tonight, which is a story about Jonathan and David. There is no doubt that these two men were very close and that these two men loved each other. As a matter of fact, their love is so intense for each other, friendship is so intense for one another, that there have been some people in the world that have disparaged Jonathan and David and have taken a verse out of context to say that they had even a physical sexual relationship. Uh, there is a verse in 1 Samuel that talks about uh, David loving Jonathan and his friendship even more than David loved women. And some people have misconstrued that to potentially suggest there was a uh, physical attraction and uh, a physical affair between the two. And that is certainly not the case. Okay, let me be very strong about that. That is a misrepresentation of Scripture. But their love for each other as a friend was very intense and it was very real. It was very authentic. And there is a lot that we can learn from them. Now, let me set the stage for a little bit, and you can skim through some of 18, 19, and 20 of 1 Samuel to get some of this. But David has just conquered Goliath. And David has come back, and he has met with a lot of pomp and ceremony. Uh, they are bragging about David. Saul has given David certain things and certain privileges. Uh, David is the man of the hour. And he is very, very popular with all of the people. And he's even popular with a lot of the ladies, a lot of the women uh, in and around the towns. And as you read through 18, something begins to develop. Something begins to happen. These people start to shout and sing. And they say something very specific. They say that Saul, King Saul, has slain his thousands. And David has slain tens of thousands. And Saul hears that, the king hears that, and he is not happy. Saul is distraught. He is angered. He is frustrated because they are saying, and the text literally says in 18 that Saul says, they're saying, I've killed my thousands, and David has killed his tens of thousands. And he became fearful of David. He knew that the God of Israel was on David's side, he knew that he himself had some issues with the, with the God of Israel, that God was not pleased with some of his actions. And he became very fearful of David. And he concocts a plan to try to keep David close. And part of that plan was to offer one of his daughters to him to be his wife, but David refused. Later on, he offers a second daughter to David as a wife. This daughter actually loved David, was in love with David, and David accepted her. But then David continued to grow powerful. Saul continued to be scared, and Saul started to put into motion some plans to kill David. Now, before we get to that, there is a passage of Scripture in 1 Samuel chapter 18, verse 1 that we're going to use as our primary text tonight. And it simply says, after David finished talking with Saul, this is, by the way, after he returns from killing Goliath, Saul is not too afraid of David at this particular moment. But after he finishes talking with Saul, Jonathan became one in spirit with David, and he loved him as himself. Now, this is where we're going to draw the thoughts of our friendship. Now, let me go ahead and, and paraphrase the rest of this story. On more than one occasion, 
the word comes to Jonathan that Saul is trying to kill your friend David. And on more than one occasion, Saul goes to, or sorry, Jonathan goes to inquire of Saul if this is true. And the end of the story, Jonathan makes a pact with David. I'm going to hide you. I'm going to go talk to my father. And if I get the sense that he's trying to kill you, I'm going to give you a signal. Okay, I'm going to give you a signal. I'm going to shoot an arrow. If it goes one direction, this it means one thing. If it goes another direction, it means something else. Bottom line, he goes to Saul. He finds out that Saul wants to kill David. And Jonathan warns David to take care of himself and flee, which David does. And Jonathan and David depart as dear friends. And of course, we know the story that you know, Saul's eventually, he will eventually lose his kingship. David will be installed as king and, and so forth. But this all starts, and this is what I'm really, really focused on. I'm not really telling the whole story of Jonathan and David. I'm looking at their friendship tonight. It all starts in 1 Samuel 18, 1, when Jonathan and David become a very close-knit friendship. And I want you to see this text. And I want you to ponder this text for a minute because I believe this text gives us what a true friend really is. Jonathan and David became one in spirit. And Jonathan loved David as himself. That is a great definition of friendship. Being one in spirit with somebody. Loving them as you love yourself giving them a place in your life, giving them a place in your heart that not too many people ever get into. That's the kind of friendship that Jonathan and David will form. And as I think about their friendship, I want to give you some thoughts on this friendship. And, and here's the first one. This friendship flowed from pure motives. You know, if you think about it, David would have not been able to really, at this particular point in his, in his life, advance Saul, I'm sorry, advance Jonathan to any status in the world. In other words, what I'm saying is there wasn't a lot that David could have done to enhance Jonathan's position in life. Think about that for a minute. Jonathan is the son of the king. Jonathan, if anything, is the heir to the throne, so to speak. Jonathan has already showed his bravery and been rewarded for his bravery for fighting the Philistines himself. So David, even though he, he killed Goliath, at this particular moment, when Jonathan and David become one in spirit, and when Jonathan loves David as himself, there is nothing really that David can do to enhance his Jonathan's life at this particular moment in time. He's already the son of the king. He's already heir to the throne. He's already been praised for his bravery against the Philistines when he took his young armor bearers we talked about a few weeks ago. In other words, there wasn't anything really in it for Jonathan as far as advancement in the kingdom, advancement uh, to the throne, and so forth. So this relationship flows out of pure motives. Sometimes I think in our friendships, maybe we friend someone because we think there's something in it for us. Or maybe they friend us because they think they can get something out of us. And maybe sometimes our friendship motives are not what they need to be. Maybe we become a friend of someone because we feel sorry for them or, or they don't have many friends. Or, or maybe we look at a friendship and think, okay, if, if I can become friends with this person Here's how it benefits me. Or they may look at you and say, if I become a friend of yours, this is how it's going to benefit me. Doesn't seem to be any real benefits at this particular moment in time when Jonathan and David became one in spirit and Jonathan loved David as himself. So this friendship seems to stem from pure motives. And I would give you an application today that our friendships need to stem from pure motives. It's not about what I can get out of a friendship. It's not what about it's not about what you can get out of a friendship. What it is about is how we can serve one another and be in tune with one another where when you need someone or I need someone, 
we have that person in our life. And I think that's what Jonathan and David are experiencing. So this friendship flows from pure motives. Second, Jonathan loved David more than he loved being the son of the king. I want you to just resonate on that and, and meditate on that just for a moment. Jonathan loves David more than he loved being the son of the king. Think about the, the frills of being the son of the king. Think about all of the benefits that Jonathan would have experienced. And when the word came to Jonathan to kill David, which Saul does, if he kills David, think about the benefits in the kingdom that he might have experienced. But yet, he never considers those benefits. And that's what I mean when I say that he loved David more than he loved being the son of the king. If he would have killed David, as Saul instructed, he would have been lauded. He would have been praised. Saul would have given him anything and everything he wanted. But he felt like his friendship with David was much more valuable to him than being the son of the king and, and receiving anything that Saul would have promised him. So Jonathan loved David more than he loved being the son of the king. Which leads me to this point. This friendship involved sacrifice. Multiple occasions, Jonathan sacrificed for the good of David. He sacrificed for the good of David because he went against his father. And he went against his father's wishes. It's never easy to go against wishes of family. I don't know if you've ever had to do that. Hopefully you haven't. Um, but Jonathan goes against the wishes of his father, who just happens to be king. And Jonathan sacrificed for David on multiple occasions. And that bonded them together. It shows us that that friendship flows from a pure motive. It shows us that he loved David more than he loved being the son of the king. And it shows us that friendships oftentimes require sacrifice. When you think about love, and, and it says that, that Jonathan loved David as himself, I think the greatest definition of love that we've ever been given comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 13. And I want you to think about this verse for a minute as we read chapter 13, verses 4 through 8. And I want you to think about how it probably fit Jonathan and David's friendship and think about how it fits your friendships as well. Love is patient, Paul says. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. I don't know if you've ever really thought about this definition that Paul gives in 1 Corinthians 13 and applied it to the story of Jonathan and David. But I want you to think about this for a minute. Think about these characteristics and these qualities and these definitions of love. And consider that Jonathan loved David as himself and he loved David more than he loved being the son of a king and that he sacrificed for David. And can you see the patience? Can you see the kindness? Can you see how it doesn't dishonor the other? Can you see how it's not self-seeking? Can you see that it doesn't delight in evil? Can you see how it protected David? Can you see the trust? Can you see the hope? Can you see the perseverance? Those are the kind of friendships that we ought to be striving for in our life. To have someone so close to us that will make sacrifices for us and we will make sacrifices for them that will love us as they love themselves, and that will love us 
more than they love other things in life that are not as important. And we need to be that kind of friend to somebody else. One of the great stories of earthly friendship that I have read about and I have seen is an old story of two football players for the Chicago Bears named Gail Sayers and Brian Piccolo. You may have seen the movie years and years and years ago. I was a kid when this movie came out and uh, it was called Brian's Song. And it was about Gail Sayers and Brian Piccolo. Gail Sayers was the star running back for the Chicago Bears. And he was a black player who became very close and a very good friend to one of the white teammates that he had at the Chicago Bears football team named Brian Piccolo. And Gail Sayers was going to be awarded the George S. Hollis Award as the most courageous player in pro football for various reasons. But at about the same time, Brian Piccolo was struck with cancer. And he had a very long ordeal with cancer. And he eventually dies due to the cancer. And as Gail Sayers stood up to accept the award for the George S. Hollis, who was the owner of the Bears, the George S. Hollis Award for most the most courageous player in pro football, as he stood up to accept that award, Brian Piccolo was in the hospital fighting for his life. And here's what Gail Sayers said in his acceptance speech. Gail said, you flatter me by giving me this award, but I tell you here and now that I accept it for Brian Piccolo. Brian Piccolo is the man of courage who should receive the George S. Hollis Award. I love Brian Piccolo. And I'd like you to love him. Tonight, when you hit your knees, please ask God to love him too. I love Brian Piccolo. This was a black man in 1969 in pro football talking about a white teammate who was struck with cancer. Race didn't matter. Wins and losses did not matter. What mattered was that Gail Sayers loved Brian Piccolo. What matters in our lesson tonight is that Jonathan loved David. And the heart of a friend will sacrifice, will love as we love ourselves, will demonstrate the qualities of 1 Corinthians 13, and will put itself ahead of earthly accomplishments, earthly achievements, or earthly benefits. And as we close this series of Matters of the Heart, that is the kind of friendships that I think we are called to in the Word of God. And those are the kind of friendships that I would encourage you to be seeking, to be forming, and to be developing. Friendships are needed in this world, and we need a lot more than Facebook friendships. I don't need 1,685 Facebook friends, even though I value my time on Facebook with them, with, with you all that are watching me tonight on Facebook. I value that. But what I need to value even more are those friends in our lives that stick close to us that love us as they love themselves, that will sacrifice for us, that will stand up and say, I love Brian Piccolo. I love David. I love my friend. The heart of a friend is needed in the 21st century. Let's be the friends that God calls us to be. And in turn, we'll have friends that God wants us to have. Let's bow together and let's pray. Father God, thank you for the heart of friendship that we see in 1 Samuel in the story of Jonathan and David. And thank you, Father, for the sacrifice and the things that stood out about that story. And thank you for the definition of love that Paul gives us, which we ought to center our relationships and our friendships on. 
And thank you for the earthly story of Gail Sayers and Brian Piccolo and how those two men bonded, became very close, and the words that Gail Sayers shared in his acceptance speech of the Hallis Award of Courage. Most of all tonight, Father, help us to be a friend that you want us to be and help us to center our lives around friends that you would have us to have in our own lives. And Father, we thank you for the friend that sticks closer than a brother. We thank you for the friend that we have in Jesus. Because of his death and his resurrection, we have forgiveness and we have salvation. We praise you and thank you for that. And we ask you to always help us to live with that sacrifice in mind. Help us to be more like Jesus daily and forgive us when we're not. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. Thank you all for being a part of Matters of the Heart tonight. And thank you also for being part of Matters of the Heart over the last 11 or 12 weeks. I hope it's been a great series. I hope that you have learned something. I hope that it's been beneficial to you in some way. I have enjoyed it. Uh, I have loved every minute of it, and we look forward to continuing together to teach the Word of God as we continue to move forward. That'll do it for this series. Uh, again, next week we will not have a pre-recorded service. We invite you to come to our summer series, June the 2nd, next Wednesday night. Lance Bennett from the Fairlane Church of Christ will be with us to kick off, uh, kick off our summer series of lessons, 630 in the auditorium. So God bless you guys. Thanks for being with us, and we will... See you soon. Take care and God bless.